Hi, I'm Sarah Maurer, and in this lecture, we'll be talking about two of the four macromolecules that make up our cells, proteins and lipids. To start, proteins are made up of small units called amino acids. Here, you can see the representative set of 20 amino acids that make up all of the proteins in your cells. There are a couple of additional amino acids that are rarely used in certain organisms, but these are the standard set. You can break these amino acids down into different categories based on their chemical structure. This is imparted by their side chain, which is shown here in a orangish color. This, each side chain has a different chemical functionality. The part in blue is the backbone of the amino acid, which will then form the peptide backbone in our proteins. One way that you can divide your amino acids is into these three groups. So we have a nonpolar group where all of the side chains have are strongly carbon containing. We have a charged polar group where all of the side chains have something like an oxygen, a sulfur, or a nitrogen, but no charge. And then we have a charged polar group where the nitrogen or the oxygen is either negatively or positively charged. And this imparts specific function. It's important that we have 20 amino acids to get a diverse range of functionality in our end product, the protein. To get proteins, we have to condense two amino acids together. This is possible by removing a water from the carboxylate, the COO minus, and the amine, the NHHH plus. We remove that water and we get what's called the peptide bond, which is shown in the product here in red. This is possible by taking a aqueous solution of amino acids, drying them down through heating and time, and then letting them react with one another. Peptide bonds form naturally through this dehydration reaction, which could have been present on early Earth to produce peptides and perhaps proteins without needing complex enzymatic mechanisms. Proteins have a very specific folded structure. So this is an example of a small folded structure where we have alpha helices, the spiral coils, and there's one beta sheet shown as an arrow that, uh, that folds up into a flat plane. These, these structures have a very specific function to recognize their target that's called a reactant or a substrate. Uh, it could be any small molecule that the protein needs to recognize. And it fits together like a lock and key. So the protein is specifically evolved to match its target. Usually, you'll need at least a few amino acids for this very specific matching to occur. Between five and eight amino acids has been shown to bind a specific target relatively strongly. And most proteins have between 50 and maybe a couple of thousand amino acids to generate their function. So we would need peptide bond formation to occur many, many times on early Earth to generate functional proteins. Some functional proteins actually catalyze reactions, bond breaking or bond making. And these proteins are called enzymes. They can do this two ways. They can either lower a transition state energy of the molecule to help the reaction proceed, or they can serve to orient and concentrate the reactants. And what this means is, if an enzyme is going to make a product from two reactants, it can get these, product, these reactants together so that they meet perfectly and end up reacting more quickly than they would if they were floating around in solution and could bump into each other in any possible way. The second type of biomolecule that we're going to talk about today is lipids. Lipids are amphiphilic molecules that self-assemble into a hydrophobic barrier that surrounds all cells. These lipids are going to be essential to identify the individual and allow for the cells to undergo Darwinian selection. So lipids are really important in our evolutionary processes. These lipids are formed, these lipids form into a bilayer where uh, one phospholipid layer meets another phospholipid layer with the hydrophobic interior, which you can see here in blue and green. At the surface, water molecules are going to interact with the polar head groups of the lipids or the hydrophilic head groups. There are a diverse 
array of different membrane forming lipids, as you can see here. And most of these lipids are going to have this glycerol backbone, which is one of the chemical structures shown. The glycerol can react with something like a fatty acid to form an ester bond. This occurs through the same reaction that we have with peptide bond formation, where you lose a water through condensation. So if you take a mixture of glycerol and fatty acid and dry it down, you'll end up with glycero fatty acids called glyceroesters. And so these, these dehydration products will then self-assemble into our membranes. The membrane functionality will be dependent on the head group, which is shown here in blue. And there are many different types of head groups. So you can see that we have a phosphate with an alcohol or maybe a phosphate with a sugar. And so these different functionalities are going to give us a lot of different membrane properties. Some organisms do not use a bilayer and instead have monolayer lipids. And that's shown here as our archaeal ether lipid. So in archaea, some lipids, which help to add stability, instead of having a single head group, have head groups on either end of the hydrophobic core. And this helps to stabilize the bilayer. Here you can see the actual chemical structure of our phospholipids, where we have the glycerol backbone in blue that's attached to our two fatty acids. And then there's a phosphate that's attached to the glycerol. And attached to that phosphate, you can get a diverse array of different uh, chemical structures from a simple proton to make phosphatic acid to something that's very complex, a sugar deriv derivative called inositol. And these different head groups are going to allow different functionalities. So for example, phosphatidylcholine, which is the predominant phospholipid that we find in mammalian cells, has a nitrogen that has a positive charge. This positive charge gives the membrane specific functionality to interact with its environment and to allow for fluidity and molecular signaling reactions. Of course, at the origins of life, these very complex phospholipids were likely not available. But we did have a chemical library of available organic molecules, and some of those are amphiphilic. So shown here, the first molecule is decanoic acid, which is one of the molecules that we see in meteorites as an organic molecule, or we also see them in certain prebiotic reactions like the fischer tropsch synthesis, which occurs in hydrothermal vents. And so there's many ways to get these prebiotic lipids that can self-assemble and form simpler, less stable membranes than we have in modern cells.